We've been planning this camping trip for months, ever since the first signs of spring started to thaw the winter's icy grip. All six of us, Mackenzie, Anthony, Ryan, Allison, Sophie, and me, finally agreed on a weekend in late October to venture into the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. It's a compromise between those of us who crave the dense forests of the Pacific Northwest and those who prefer the more familiar terrain closer to our home base in Atlanta. The Great Smoky Mountains National Park seems like the perfect middle ground. Today, after weeks of anticipation, we pack our cars with camping gear, food, and all the outdoor essentials. We set out in the early morning, hoping to reach the campsite before afternoon. The drive itself is a picturesque journey, with lush trees showcasing the splendor of fall, reds, oranges, and yellows splashed against the canvas of the forest. The air gets crisper as we ascend into the mountains, each turn offering an even more breathtaking view than the last. Finally, we arrive at the Elkmont Campground, one of the most popular sites in the park. It's relatively empty, perhaps because most people are deterred by the late season weather. We're just happy it means fewer neighbors and more solitude. We select a site that offers a balance of open space and tree cover, somewhere we can easily pitch our tents, yet still feel enveloped by the wilderness. Mackenzie and Allison immediately get to work on the tents, expertly threading poles through fabric loops. Anthony and Ryan are on firewood duty, venturing into the woods with axes in hand. Sophie has her camera out and is capturing every moment, from the menial tasks of setting up camp to the natural beauty surrounding us. By the time we finish setting up, the sun has reached its peak in the sky. We take a moment to admire our handiwork. Three tents neatly aligned, a fire pit ready for tonight's bonfire and a makeshift kitchen area where we'll prepare our meals. We have the rest of the day to explore, and we're eager to take advantage of it. But first, lunch. We prepare sandwiches and a salad, taking time to enjoy our first meal in the great outdoors. Mackenzie brings out her infamous chocolate chip cookies for dessert. As we eat, we discuss plans for the afternoon. A consensus is reached to go for a hike, targeting a trail known for its waterfall views. Everyone have their hiking boots? Anthony asks as we prepare to set out. Yep, good to go, Ryan replies, double-knotting his laces for good measure. The hike proves to be both exhilarating and exhausting, filling our lungs with fresh mountain air and our souls with a sense of peace that's hard to find in the city. We reach the waterfall, and it's just as breathtaking as promised, a cascade of water tumbling over rocks framed by the autumn foliage. Sophie, of course, takes this opportunity to snap a few photos, capturing the beauty for posterity. We make it back to camp just as the sun begins its descent, casting a golden glow over our sight. Dinner is a feast of grilled burgers and roasted veggies, followed by the obligatory s'mores. Hey guys, do you think we brought enough food? Mackenzie asks as she pulls a large bag of marshmallows from one of the several plastic containers laid out on the wooden picnic table. The table is covered with an array of food items, bags of chips, sandwich fixings, canned beans, and a cooler full of drinks. With the amount you eat never, Anthony replies. His joke is punctuated by the sound of a stick landing on an already sizable pile of firewood. He's been busy collecting branches and logs from the surrounding area, anticipating a night of storytelling and laughter around the campfire. Our laughter rings out, filling the open space of our campsite nestled among towering pine trees. Above us, the sky is a brilliant shade of blue. The sun is at its zenith, casting a warm, inviting glow on our setup. We have tents assembled in a semicircle around the fire pit. Camping chairs are unfolded, and backpacks are neatly placed next to each tent. Despite the idyllic setting, we are aware of the looming weather change. We've been occupied with setting up camp and preparing lunch, a smorgasbord of deli meats, cheeses, and bread. But as we move toward dinner time, we become aware of the shifting atmosphere. The wind rustles the treetops more aggressively, and the sky transforms. Once bright and clear, it's now clouding over, becoming a canvas of darkening grays. Noticing the change, Anthony pulls out his phone from the pocket of his cargo shorts. He taps the screen a few times and studies the weather app, and his face turns serious. Guys, this isn't looking good, Anthony announces, holding his phone out for us to see. The screen displays a weather map, and even with our limited meteorological knowledge, we can tell the approaching storm system is large and intense. 
The storm is moving faster than expected, he continues. It's not just a bit of snow, it's a lot, and it's headed directly for us. His words sink in, cutting through the earlier excitement. We glance at each other, concern replacing the smiles on our faces. It's no longer a question of whether we have enough marshmallows or chips. We are faced with the more pressing concern of how to stay safe and warm in what is rapidly turning into a challenging situation. Snow? Are you kidding? Allison's eyes widen as she stares at Anthony's phone screen, displaying the weather alert. Her concern is visible, even in the dimming light. She tugs at the zipper of her fleece jacket, as if the action might somehow fend off the cold that's threatening to envelop us. No time for jokes, Ryan interjects, looking equally worried. He sets down the campfire poker he was using to stoke the fire. The flames, once cheerful and inviting, now seem insufficient against the impending storm. What's our plan? We can't stay in the tents. It's going to be impossible, I say, gripped by a sense of urgency. The fabric of our tents is sturdy, but not designed to withstand heavy snowfall and strong winds. We need to find shelter and quickly. All right, grab the essentials, Sophie commands. Her camera, which was out and ready to capture our camping moments, is swiftly packed into its bag. The bag zipper makes a quick zipping sound as she secures it. She slings it over her shoulder, already thinking ahead to what we'll need to survive the night. We all spring into action, our earlier relaxation replaced by adrenaline-fueled focus. Mackenzie opens the largest of our storage containers and starts pulling out bottles of water. Each bottle is placed into backpacks that we've emptied in a rush, leaving behind non-essentials like extra clothes and games. Allison grabs canned food and a can opener, adding them to her pack. Anthony tosses in a first aid kit, its red color a stark contrast to the earthy tones of our camping gear. Ryan and I are on flashlight duty, checking to make sure they work before adding them to the growing pile of necessities. We pull on our thickest jackets, hats, and gloves, bracing ourselves for the cold. Our boots are laced tightly, ready for the trek that lies ahead. Backpacks are hoisted onto shoulders, their weight a reminder of the seriousness of our situation. With one last glance at our campsite, we set off towards a dense part of the forest. The trees there are older and thicker, promising some degree of shelter from the wind and snow. We move quickly, following a barely visible trail that Anthony had explored earlier in the day. Our flashlights cut through the growing darkness, creating pools of light on the forest floor. As if on cue, the first snowflakes start to fall. At first, they're sparse, floating down lazily from the sky. But within minutes, they multiply, and the air is filled with a flurry of white. What started as a delicate snowfall rapidly transforms into a torrential downpour of snow. We quicken our pace, aware that every minute counts. The snow is relentless and the wind starts to howl a clear sign that the storm is not just arriving, but is already here, full force. We tighten our hoods and pull our backpack straps closer, pressing on in search of the shelter that is now essential for our survival. Boots heavy and faces stung by the icy wind, we spot it, a cave, hidden behind a dense thicket of prickly bushes and under a rocky overhang, the cave opens up like a dark mouth in the mountainside. It appears to be empty and more importantly, large enough to accommodate all of us. Relief washes over us as we move inside, leaving the biting cold and howling wind behind. I'll start the fire, Anthony announces, dropping his backpack and pulling out some of the firewood he had the foresight to bring along. He sets up the logs in the center of the cave, away from the walls, and starts stacking smaller twigs and leaves as kindling. Good, I'm freezing, Mackenzie admits, her voice shaking a bit. She vigorously rubs her gloved hands up and down her arms in an attempt to generate some heat. Her face is red, not just from the cold, but also from the relief that comes with finding refuge. Allison and Ryan, who have been quiet during our trek, now spring into action. They unzip their backpacks and begin to unload our food supplies onto a flat rock that serves as a makeshift table. Canned beans, bags of trail mix, and even a loaf of bread are carefully arranged. Sophie, who until now had been contemplating whether to capture this dramatic turn of events with her camera, decides against it. She sets her camera bag in a corner of the cave. Out of the way. This moment, she seems to think, is not one for posterity but for immediate practical concerns. Anthony strikes a match and holds it to the kindling, 
After a tense moment where it seems the fire might not catch, the twigs start to crackle, then burst into flames. Anthony adds more logs, and soon we have a fire that roars with both heat and light, casting dancing shadows on the cave walls. The atmosphere in the cave starts to change almost instantly. The fire's warmth pushes back the cave's damp chill, filling the air with a smoky but comforting scent. It's a small triumph, but under the circumstances it feels monumental. Eager to shed the cold that has seeped into our bones, we huddle as close to the fire as safety allows. We stretch out our hands and feet towards the flame, wiggling our fingers and toes to encourage circulation. Our wet clothes start to steam as they dry, and for the first time in what feels like hours, our shivering starts to subside. Our faces, which had been pinched in concentration and concern, begin to relax. The dire situation is far from resolved, but for now, in this moment, we have fire, we have food, and we are sheltered. At least we're not in the storm, right? Mackenzie tries to inject some optimism into the tense atmosphere. She rummages through her backpack and pulls out a box of granola bars. Tearing the box open, she offers one to each of us, her eyes meeting ours as if to say, we'll get through this. Yeah, it could be worse, Ryan chimes in, grabbing a granola bar and taking an absent-minded bite. But even as he says it, I notice his gaze drift past us, focusing deeper into the shadowy depths of the cave. His eyes narrow and his expression turns puzzled, as if he's trying to make sense of something he can't quite place. You okay? I inquire, catching his attention. His eyes snap back to me, and for a moment he seems to weigh whether to say what's on his mind. Yeah, just thought I heard something, he finally admits. He shakes his head briskly, as if trying to physically dispel whatever thought or sound had momentarily captured his attention. Our collective energy is low, but the fire's steady warmth starts to act like a bomb, alleviating the sharp edges of our concerns, at least temporarily. With the immediate crisis of shelter and warmth resolved, we start to unwind. Conversations become less about immediate needs and more about life outside this cave. We share stories of past adventures, favorite meals, and even discuss the latest season of a popular TV show. Despite the laughter and chatter, there's an undercurrent of discomfort that we all seem to feel but choose not to acknowledge. A nagging feeling that we're not the only occupants of this cave clings to each of us. Every so often, one of us will pause, eyes darting to a dark corner or ears straining to pick up a sound that doesn't belong. But each time we dismiss it, attributing the uneasy feeling to the stress of the situation and the relentless howling of the wind outside the cave's entrance. After all, our senses are heightened and the mind has a way of playing tricks when under duress. Still, the unspoken consensus is clear. It's easier to attribute our disquiet to familiar, understandable factors like stress or the storm outside. Acknowledging the possibility that we might not be alone in this cave would mean confronting an entirely different kind of danger, one that none of us are ready to face. The fire flickers, casting a warm glow on everyone's faces, but its light doesn't reach the far corners of the cave, which remain engulfed in darkness. We're huddled close to the flames, bundled up in whatever clothing we brought along. The mood is somber. We've all stopped talking, each lost in thought about the situation we're in. Allison's sudden question pulls us back to the moment. She's visibly tense, her posture rigid as she leans slightly forward, trying to pick up the sound that caught her attention. What are you talking about? Mackenzie glances away from her phone screen, which displays a low battery warning. She holds it in her hand, debating whether to turn it off to preserve the little power that's left. Allison insists. There's a weird noise, like someone whispering. For a moment, we all hold our breaths, focusing solely on the sounds around us. The fire continues to crackle and pop, its noise mixing with the sound of the wind that's still strong outside the cave. We all go quiet, listening intently. At first, I hear nothing but the crackle of the fire and the distant howl of the wind outside. And then, faintly, a whispering sound drifts from deeper within the cave. It's soft and unintelligible, but unmistakably there. It's probably just the wind, Ryan suggests, but he doesn't sound convinced. Yeah, wind that knows how to whisper, Anthony quips nervously. We try to shake it off and go back to our conversations, but the atmosphere has changed. We're all a little more alert. 
ears tuned to any sound that isn't one of us or the fire. Then Ryan stands up abruptly. Where's my water bottle? We search the immediate area. His water bottle, which he distinctly remembers placing next to his backpack, is gone. Ryan is adamant as he points to the area next to his bag. I swear I put it right there. His insistence carries a tone of growing worry. His eyes meet each of ours in turn as if silently pleading for someone to produce a logical explanation. Sophie, always the pragmatist, offers one. Maybe you misplaced it. Yet even she can't keep a slight tremor out of her voice. She looks uneasy, as though she's aware her explanation doesn't fully sit right with the rest of what's going on. Before we can delve into a deeper discussion about the missing water bottle, Anthony interrupts us. Guys, look at this. He's moved away from our makeshift campsite and is now standing next to one of the cave's walls. In his hand, the flashlight casts a focused beam on the rock face, revealing etched symbols. We cluster around Anthony, eyes widening as the light illuminates a series of inscriptions. They aren't random scratches or marks. They form a deliberate pattern. They appear to represent some form of language or script, though it's unlike anything I've ever encountered. Is that writing, Mackenzie says, her voice a mix of disbelief and a mounting sense of dread. She looks from the wall to each of us as if hoping someone will tell her she's imagining things. Anthony moves his flashlight up and down, illuminating more of the strange etchings. I don't know, but it doesn't look natural, that's for sure, he says. There's a noticeable quiver in his voice, a raw edge that I've rarely heard from him. With that, the gravity of our situation becomes impossible to ignore. We are not alone in this cave. We need to leave, Allison declares. Her voice trembles with evident panic, and she scans our faces for agreement. And go where? Into the storm, Ryan retorts, his voice tinged with a mix of incredulity and frustration. Look, I'm not thrilled about staying here, but what are our options? Maybe it's better to face a storm than whatever made those symbols. I chime in. I'm torn, my own voice carrying a mix of reluctance and a pinch of dread. I look around, trying to gauge the room. We're all on edge, but no one is willing to make the final call on what we should do. But it's Sophie who finally breaks the deadlock. Listen, we don't know what we're dealing with, but I do know that we're safer together, she says firmly. The storm is still raging outside, she continues, gesturing vaguely toward the cave entrance where the sound of howling wind and pelting snow is still audible. Our best bet is to stick together, keep the fire going, and wait it out. We can handle this. Her words have a grounding effect, cutting through the fog of fear and doubt that has settled over us. One by one, we nod in agreement each of us coming to the realization that Sophie is right. Our strength is indeed in our unity. We stick together then, Anthony says, succinctly summing up the group's unspoken consensus. He throws another log onto the fire, the flames leaping up as if encouraged by our decision. We return to our circle around the fire, each of us sitting noticeably closer to one another than before. The atmosphere is tense, and our senses are heightened to a near excruciating level. Each sound that drifts from the unseen depths of the cave, the slightest creak or distant whisper makes us jump. But we put on brave faces for our own sakes as well as for each other's. But deep down, each of us is wrestling with the same realization. We are sharing this cave with something, something we can't see but feel is ever-present. Then, out of nowhere, a sharp scream shatters the quiet. We all snap our heads toward Allison. She's gripping her arm tightly, her knuckles white. Blood is seeping through her fingers from a gash that seems to have appeared out of nowhere. His voice tinged with both concern and alarm. He moves quickly toward Allison, his face a mask of confusion and worry. I have no idea. Something slashed me, Allison exclaims. Her voice quivers with panic and her eyes are wide with disbelief. Anthony is already on his feet, lunging for the first aid kit we had stashed near the backpacks. He rips it open and hurriedly pulls out gauze and antiseptic without wasting a second. He starts to clean Allison's wound, his hands working quickly but cautiously as he wraps a bandage tightly around her arm to stem the bleeding. Then Sophie gets up and walks over to our bags laying against the cave wall behind us. I'm doing a quick check of our supplies to see if there's anything that might help us, Sophie announces. She zips open her bag and starts rummaging through its contents. A flashlight, some rope, a utility knife. 
and then her fingers hit something at the bottom of her bag that makes her stop. Curious, she grabs it and pulls it out. It's an old journal, its cover worn and pages yellowed. Guys, look at this, she says, holding up the journal, her eyebrows furrowed in puzzlement. How did it get in my bag? Intriguing as it is creepy, I reply. Might as well see what's inside. It could be relevant. Sophie opens the journal and starts flipping through its brittle pages. Her eyes scan the entries quickly before she begins to read aloud. June 14th, 2015. I can't sleep. The noises are getting louder like whispers, but not quite. Things are missing from our camp. Jason is sure he put his flashlight next to his sleeping bag, but now it's gone. She turns a few pages and continues. June 16th, 2015. The symbols on the walls are like nothing I've ever seen. They aren't just random. They are part of some language, a script maybe. I feel eyes on me. We all do. Mark says it's just stress, but I don't think so. Her voice grows softer as she reaches the last entry. June 18th, 2015. It's our last night, or it's supposed to be. We figured out a way to keep the entity at bay. Whatever is in this cave with us doesn't like. Sophie's voice stops abruptly, her eyes widening as she turns the page. It's torn, precisely at the point where it should reveal this vital piece of information. With a sense of disbelief, she flips through the remaining blank pages, but there's nothing more. You've got to be kidding me, Mackenzie says, her voice revealing a mix of disbelief and fear that seems to echo in the confined space of the cave. Okay, listen up, Anthony commands, his eyes making contact with each of us in a deliberate manner. He stands to make his point, filling the small space with his presence. We can't just sit here and do nothing. We need to take action. But what can we do? Ryan's voice is tinged with a frustration that mirrors the helplessness we all feel. His eyes dart from face to face as if searching for answers that he knows aren't there. We stick to the plan. Sophie's voice cuts through the tension like a knife. Her eyes lock onto ours one by one as if willing us to agree. Stay together, keep the fire going, and wait. It's all we can do. We nod in agreement as the alternative is too frightening to contemplate. Allison picks up a log and places it on the fire, the flames licking at the wood before enveloping it entirely. Then a low growl rises from the darkest recesses of the cave. It's a sound unlike any we've heard, chilling in its implications. We exchange glances, seeing our own fears reflected back at us in a tapestry of wide eyes and tight lips. Did everyone hear that, or am I losing it? Anthony's voice is so soft it's almost drowned out by the crackling of the fire. His eyes are wide, his face pale. We heard it, I affirm, my voice betraying the shakiness I feel but can't hide. The weight of dread in the cave feels almost physical, pressing in on us from all sides. Each little noise, even the subtle settling of rocks, jolts us and keeps us alert. Suddenly I hear the sound of a flashlight clattering to the cave floor. I look around the others and see Ryan, who was just here, has disappeared. It's as if he was swallowed by the darkness itself. Ryan, Ryan. My voice bounces off the cave walls, creating a series of haunting echoes. What the hell is happening in this cave? What's in here with us? Anthony asks, as his hands clench into fists. Allison's eyes are open wide. Her face is pale but flushed from the adrenaline. That's it, we can't wait any longer. We have to get out of this cave immediately. The urgency in Anthony and Allison's voices drives home the gravity of our situation. One of us is missing, and whatever is lurking in the cave is beyond our understanding. It's time for action, and every second counts. Despite the hostile conditions outside, the howling winds and the blanket of snow, we take quick action. We grab the essential items, canned food, the first aid kit complete with Allison's used bandages, flashlights with extra batteries and other necessities. Bundled in our coats, hats, and scarves, we muster the courage to step into the storm. Snowflakes immediately cling to our clothing, and the wind seems to cut through every layer, but we push forward. However, something feels off as we walk. The landscape around us seems to subtly move, almost as if rearranging itself. Confusion sets in, and before we can fully process what's happening, we find ourselves back at the entrance to the cave. It's as though the cave itself, or some invisible force, has pulled us back. This can't be happening, Mackenzie mutters, staring at the cave as if expecting it to offer some answers. 
We're either going in circles or something is actively pulling us back here, Sophie observes. Her eyes narrow as they scan the length of the cave, her gaze pausing momentarily on the symbols etched into the walls. Frustrated yet determined, we re-enter the cave. Our eyes search every nook and cranny, every odd rock formation and every shadow. We're desperate for clues, for something that might offer us a way to escape this nightmarish situation. We have to find something useful in here, I mutter, my eyes landing on the old journal Sophie found earlier. Maybe we overlooked something. With that thought in mind, I snatch the journal and flip through its yellowing, brittle pages. As I begin to read, the others huddle around me. We dissect every sentence, scrutinizing every word for its possible significance. The atmosphere is tense. Our collective focus is sharp. We know this journal might be our only chance at understanding what we're up against and how to combat it. Sophie, who has been skimming the earlier entries, looks up with widened eyes. Hold on a second, she exclaims. It says here that the writer felt the entity was particularly drawn to light. Do you think we could use that information to our advantage? Anthony jumps at the idea. That's worth a try, he says. He immediately starts collecting dry twigs and leaves from the cave floor. If this entity is attracted to light, perhaps we can create some sort of diversion, something that will pull its focus away from the entrance long enough for us to make a break for it. The sense of urgency is palpable as we brainstorm how best to utilize this newfound information. After a quick discussion, we decide to use one of our flashlights as the source of light for the diversion. Allison volunteers her flashlight, clicking it on and off to make sure it's in good working order. We can set the flashlight in the middle of the twigs and leaves, Mackenzie suggests. That way the light diffuses and covers more area. If it's drawn to light, it won't be able to resist. Nodding in agreement, we place the flashlight carefully amid the dry twigs and leaves that Anthony gathered. We aim it in a direction opposite the cave's entrance, hoping to lure the entity as far away as possible. All right, are we ready for this, I ask, looking around at the faces of my friends. Each of us knows what's at stake, and each of us is ready to try anything for a shot at freedom. Let's turn on the flashlight and make a run for it. It's now or never. I take a deep breath and click the flashlight on. A beam of light cuts through the darkness of the cave, casting shadows on the walls. For a moment, everything is still. Then, a low, guttural growl reverberates from the depths of the cave, followed by the sound of shuffling footsteps. Our eyes widen in collective horror as we see it, a formless shadow darker than the surrounding darkness moving towards the light. For the first time, we're not just dealing with an invisible force. The entity is making itself known. The air turns colder, as if the cave itself is recoiling from the presence of this being. For a few seconds we're frozen in place, our eyes locked onto the approaching entity. It's as if we're caught in some sort of trance, unable to look away, unable to move. The flashlight flickers, as if struggling to maintain its glow in the presence of such malevolence. Finally, Mackenzie breaks the silence with a sharp yell. Run! Her voice snaps us out of our paralysis. We turn on our heels, adrenaline fueling our movements, and bolt towards the cave's entrance. As we run, I glance back just in time to see the entity reach the flashlight. The light flickers out, plunging the cave into darkness once more. But there's no time to think about that now. We have to get out. We burst through the cave's entrance into the snowstorm outside. The snow is falling heavily, and the wind howls around us, but we don't care. For the first time, we feel like we've put some distance between ourselves and whatever that entity is. We keep running, trudging through the deep snow driven by a primal need to distance ourselves from the cave and its dark inhabitant. The storm rages on, but it's a lesser evil compared to what we've left behind. Finally we stop, gasping for breath, our eyes meeting in a mix of relief and lingering fear. For now at least we have escaped. As we continue to trudge through the snow-covered landscape, I can't help but think of Ryan. He's gone and the reality sets in that we may never find out what happened to him. Suddenly a glimmer catches my eye through the swirling snowflakes. At first I think it's a trick of the light, or perhaps my imagination playing games with me. But then, as we get closer, the glimmer becomes more defined. It's a light, a beacon in the distance cutting through the darkness and the snow. My heart starts pounding in my chest as I realize what it is. 
the soft glow of a cabin window. An indescribable relief washes over me. The sight of that light is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. We quicken our pace, almost stumbling over ourselves in our eagerness to reach the cabin. Every step feels lighter now, as if we're being pulled towards safety by the promise of that distant light. Our exhaustion and fear are momentarily forgotten, replaced by a newfound hope. Finally, we arrive. The cabin is modest but inviting, a single light shining through the window onto the snowy landscape. We don't question our good fortune, we simply accept it, too weary and relieved to care about the hows and whys. We open the door and step inside, leaving the cold, the forest, and the lurking entity behind us. Inside, the cabin is warm and welcoming, filled with the rustic charm of wooden furniture and simple amenities. We shed our wet coats and boots, our bodies aching but grateful for the respite. For the first time in what feels like an eternity, we allow ourselves to relax, to breathe, and to feel a sense of security. Even as we settle into the cabin, the journal and the horrifying events of the night remain in the back of my mind. I realize that we may never fully understand what happened, why it happened, or what that entity was, and we'll probably never know what happened to Ryan. But for now, that's okay. We're safe, and that's what matters. As I look out the window at the snow-covered forest, it feels like we've emerged from a dark dream into a new reality, forever marked, but also forever grateful for this escape. The forest will always be there, its depths hiding secrets we may never unravel, but we've made it out. I sit in my cramped office cubicle, staring at the glowing computer screen in front of me. Numbers and formulas fill my vision, one spreadsheet blurring into the next. My phone buzzes for the umpteenth time today, another email that demands immediate attention. The stress is piling up, and I can feel a headache forming at the base of my skull. The office is loud today. People chatting, printers whirring, phones ringing, and all I want is silence. Finally, I reach a breaking point. I minimize the spreadsheet, open a new tab, and type in secluded cabin rentals near me. I scroll through the options. Most are too fancy, boasting Wi-Fi and hot tubs, things I don't need or want right now. I want isolation, not luxury. Then I find it, a rustic one-room cabin set deep in the woods. No amenities, no distractions, perfect. I book it for a week starting tomorrow, a spontaneous decision but necessary. I rush home after work, throwing clothes and essentials into a duffel bag. I hit the grocery store next stocking up on simple foods that don't require much cooking. Canned beans, rice, fresh vegetables, and a steak for the first night. No reason I can't treat myself a little after all. I go to bed early, setting my alarm for an ungodly hour. The cabin is a few hours' drive away, and I want to get an early start. The next morning, I'm on the road before the sun rises. The journey is peaceful, each mile taking me further away from my daily responsibilities and headaches. The sunlight filters through the trees, casting a dappled pattern on the road ahead. I roll down the window and inhale deeply, taking in the crisp fresh air that my city apartment can never offer. My phone loses its signal, and I feel a strange mixture of anxiety and relief. The absence of emails, calls, and endless notifications is jarring, but it's exactly what I came here for. I glance at my printed directions just to confirm, realizing I'm completely off the grid now. As I make the final turn indicated on my instructions, I start to see a clearing up ahead. The forest gives way to a small open area, and there it is, the cabin I've rented for the week. It sits alone in the clearing, surrounded by tall grass and wildflowers. It's a simple structure, built of logs and featuring a single chimney. A small porch with a couple of rocking chairs completes the picture. No neighboring cabins, no roads leading elsewhere. It's just me and the solitude I so desperately need. A smile crosses my face for the first time in weeks. Beside the cabin, a small fire pit is ringed with stones, looking as though it hasn't been used in a while. Further away, I see a wooden dock extending into a still pond. The water reflects the sky and trees, disturbed only by the occasional ripple of a fish swimming below the surface. A canoe leans against a tree near the water, worn but sturdy. I pull into the makeshift driveway, a simple dirt patch next to the cabin, and turn off the engine. For a moment I just sit there, taking it all in. 
I'm really doing this, spending a week cut off from the world in a cabin in the woods. With a sigh that's part relief and part trepidation, I unbuckle my seatbelt. My normal life feels both incredibly distant and uncomfortably close as I prepare to step out and begin my week of isolation. I unload my car and take a deep breath of the fresh, clean air. This is exactly what I need. I unlock the door to the cabin, pushing it open to reveal the space where I'll be spending the next week. The immediate smell is a mix of old wood from the walls and floor, accompanied by a faint hint of mildew. These scents confirm that this place is as rustic as advertised, which is exactly what I need right now. I step inside and take a deep, cleansing breath. The absence of city noise is refreshing, and the mental image of endless spreadsheets and email chains starts to fade. All that exists for me now is this cabin and the surrounding wilderness. Surveying the interior, I see a small kitchenette to my left, equipped with a sink, a kitchen, a mini-fridge, and a couple of cabinets. There's a single bedroom adjacent to it, which I assume contains just the basics, a bed and maybe a dresser. On my right is a living area furnished with a worn but comfortable-looking couch, a coffee table, and a stone fireplace. What's absent are a TV and any Wi-Fi router. This lack of modern distractions is a blessing, confirming that my time here will be spent detached from the digital world. I begin to unpack my bags. Opening the fridge, I place my perishables inside. The steak that I had planned for tonight's dinner is the first thing I put in. After all the food is stored, I turn my attention to the fireplace. I gather some kindling and logs from the stack next to it, positioning them as best as I can remember from a childhood Boy Scout trip. Striking a match, I attempt to get a fire going. It's a humbling experience. Taking me longer than I'd like to admit. But after some persistence, I hear the satisfying sound of wood crackling and watch as the flames begin to dance. Feeling a sense of accomplishment, I decide it's time to tackle dinner. I grab the steak from the fridge and place it on a cast iron skillet. A sprinkle of salt and pepper is all I use for seasoning. Why complicate things? The steak sizzles as it meets the hot surface, and I flip it a couple of times until it's cooked to what I judge as medium rare. Finally, it's time to eat. I take the skillet off the fire and, using a fork, cut a piece of the steak. I eat it right out of the pan, no point in making more dishes than necessary. It's a simple meal, yet it feels like one of the most rewarding I've had in months. After my satisfying meal, I'm eager to dive into the book that's been collecting dust on my bedside table for months. I reach into my backpack and pull out the worn paperback. The lantern on the table casts its warm yellow glow over the pages as I open to the first chapter. The light flickers slightly, making the words dance. I start to read, getting lost in the story that unfolds. There's something comforting about the tactile sensation of flipping through actual pages. My fingers appreciate the break from incessantly tapping on a keyboard or scrolling on a smartphone my eyes start to feel heavy, and I let out a long, drawn-out yawn. The fatigue from a grueling work week is finally catching up to me, pulling me towards sleep. Setting the book aside on the coffee table, I stand and reach for the lantern's knob to extinguish the flame. The darkness that follows feels immediate and thick, broken only by the flickering light from the fireplace. I stretch my arms above my head and hear the audible pops from my wrists and shoulders, like they're voicing their complaints about the sudden movement. Just as I'm about to use the fire tongs to rearrange the burning logs for the night, a scratching sound reaches my ears. It comes from below, emanating from underneath the wooden floorboards. The noise is low but clear, scratch. There's no consistent rhythm to it. But the sound persists. My heart rate involuntarily quickens. My eyes dart to the fireplace poker leaning against the hearth, it's solid iron with a sharp point, potentially a weapon if it comes to that. I try to rationalize the sound. Could be a raccoon or maybe a squirrel, I mutter, attempting to assure myself. They sometimes find their way under buildings like this. But even as I say it, the scratching grows in volume, as if challenging my flimsy explanation. The noise starts to dominate the cabin's ambiance, drowning out the crackling of the fire and the night sounds from outside. Despite my rational mind telling me it could be nothing, the thought that it might be something more starts to take hold. Ignoring it would be the easiest course of action, but curiosity grips me tightly. I can't just let it go. 
I have to know what's down there. The scratching continues, now impossible to ignore. It becomes clear that I won't be able to rest until I've investigated the mysterious noise. Earlier, when I first walked into the cabin, I had noticed a rug tucked away in the corner of the room. At that time, it seemed like just another piece of decor. Now I recall its presence and walk over to investigate, suspecting it might conceal access to the space below the floor. I grip the edge of the rug and pull it aside, revealing a wooden trap door underneath. The door has a rusty handle that seems to have been unused for a while. I pause and take a moment to weigh my options. Do I really want to know what's down there? The ongoing scratching sound answers the question for me. It's as though whatever is making the noise is insisting on being discovered. My attention shifts back to the fireplace poker leaning against the hearth. With a cautious step I walk over, pick up the poker, and grip it tightly in one hand. Its cold iron form offers a small degree of reassurance. Returning to the trapdoor, I crouch down and grab the rusty handle with my free hand. I pull, and the hinges groan in a loud complaint, breaking the relative silence of the cabin. The door swings open to reveal an abyss of darkness below, swallowing up the meager light from the dying fireplace. It feels like a gaping mouth, ready to consume whatever dares to enter. My heart pounds against my ribcage like a frantic drum, urging me to either flee or proceed. Taking one last deep breath to steady my shaky nerves, I prepare myself for what's to come. Well, here goes nothing, I think, trying to inject some courage into myself. Grasping the poker more tightly than ever, I lower my foot onto the first rung of the ladder that descends into the darkness. And then, with a mix of fear and a desire for answers, I start my descent into the unknown below. As I descend the creaky ladder, each step I take elicits a groan from the wood, and it feels like it hasn't been used in years. When my feet finally meet the dirt floor, it feels like landing on another planet. The air here is thick with the moisture you'd expect from a place devoid of sunlight. A strong scent of mold and decay permeates the air, assaulting my senses. Switching on the flashlight I'd wisely kept in my pocket, I cast its beam into the murkiness. My feet shift uneasily on the dirt floor, which is uneven and pocked with small holes and indentations. The ground is damp, and I can feel the moisture seeping through the soles of my shoes. The space is punctuated by wooden support beams that look old and somewhat rotted. I hear the slow drip of water in the distance. As I sweep my flashlight around, I notice a rickety wooden table pushed against one wall. The table is cluttered with various items, old newspapers, a corroded pocket watch, and what looks like a rusted set of keys. Each object seems to tell a silent, incomplete story, and I wonder what series of events left them abandoned here. My light then catches the edge of something metallic. Turning, I find an old padlocked chest sitting in the corner. Its wood is weathered, and the metal parts are tinged with rust. It exudes a sense of mystery, but also foreboding. What could be so important or dangerous that it needed to be locked away down here? Above me the ceiling is low and lined with cobwebs, their intricate designs shimmering slightly in the artificial light. The webs are thick and dusty, as though they've been spun by generations of spiders. I have to duck my head slightly to avoid them. The beam of my flashlight comes to rest on a dusty makeshift bookshelf, built into the wall, crowded with an array of diaries and notebooks. Overcoming the knot of fear in my stomach, I find myself reaching for one. The cover is worn, the leather peeling at the corners. I open it carefully, flipping through its yellowed pages. Entry 1. I arrived at the cabin today, and it's exactly what I had been hoping for. Secluded, rustic, and far away from the city. I cooked dinner on the little stove and took a walk in the woods. There's something about being out here that makes me feel alive, like I can finally breathe without the weight of daily responsibilities suffocating me. But as night fell, things started to feel a bit off. I can't put my finger on it, but there are strange noises coming from beneath the cabin. It's probably just an animal or the wind, but it's unsettling. I keep hearing scratches, like claws against wood. I'm writing this by lantern light and the scratching seems to have stopped for now. Maybe I'm just letting my imagination get the better of me. But there's a nagging feeling in the back of my mind, a little voice telling me that I should check it out. 
For now, I'll just try to get some sleep. Entry 2 I didn't sleep well last night. The scratching sounds continued, and I was plagued by nightmares that I can barely remember, filled with shadowy figures and haunting screams. I woke up several times, drenched in sweat. There's a sense of dread hanging over me that I can't shake off. Today I walked around the cabin trying to see if I could find any signs of what could be making those noises. Nothing. The woods around the cabin are quiet, almost eerily so, but when I came back, I swear I felt like I was being watched, like eyes were on me but I couldn't see them. I'm really starting to question my decision to come here. I came to find peace, but all I've found is anxiety. I've decided to stay one more night. If things don't improve, I'm packing up and leaving first thing in the morning. Entry 3. I can't take it anymore. The sounds are louder now. They're accompanied by an unbearable feeling that I'm not alone, that something is lurking in the shadows. Every time I try to close my eyes, visions of twisted, deformed faces haunt me. Earlier today, I discovered a trap door beneath a rug in the corner of the room. I was tempted to open it, to investigate the source of these sounds and sensations, but fear held me back. What if I uncover something I can't handle? What if the dread I'm feeling is a warning? I've made up my mind. I'm leaving. Whatever is going on here, it's beyond my understanding and far beyond what I came here for. I'm packing my bags and leaving as soon as the sun rises. If you're reading this, take it as a warning. Leave. Don't stay here. And don't look beneath the floor. As I finish reading the last entry, a wave of cold realization washes over me. The emotions described in these pages mirror my own. My eyes dart to the last sentence. Don't look beneath the floor. A shiver runs down my spine. My grip tightens around the poker and flashlight, my knuckles turning white. A voice inside my head screams for me to leave, climb back up that ladder, lock the trap door, and get out of this place as fast as I can. Yet part of me is gripped by the curiosity of what happened to them. Beside the diary, my flashlight reveals a stack of old photographs. They're held together by a discolored rubber band that has lost much of its elasticity. I pick up the first photograph and it shows a family. A mother, father, two kids, and even a dog. They're all standing in front of the cabin, smiling as if they've just discovered a slice of heaven. The cabin in the photo appears inviting, not like the ominous place I'm now standing in. The trees behind them are lush, and the sky is a bright, cheerful blue. The second photograph shows a young couple, arms wrapped around each other, grinning from ear to ear. They are sitting on the porch of the cabin, a picnic table set with a red and white checkered cloth, wine glasses, and a basket. The next photo is of a solo traveler, much like myself. He is holding up a fish he probably caught in a nearby stream, looking proud and content. The photo is a bit dated from the look of the man's clothes and the quality of the image. I then come across a group of friends, gathered around a campfire, drinks in hand and smiles on their faces. They seem so carefree, so unaware of the fate that might have awaited them. It's the last set of photos that chills me the most. These pictures feature those same people, but they are anything but recognizable. The cheerful family that stood in front of the cabin now appears deformed. The mother's face is elongated, her eyes sunken deep into their sockets, looking more like dark voids than eyes. The father's arms have twisted into something resembling gnarled tree branches, extending in grotesque angles. The children's smiles are replaced by mouthfuls of jagged, sharp teeth, jutting out irregularly. Even the dog is altered. Its fur looks spiky, and its eyes glow an unsettling red. The young couple from the second photo is just as disturbing. The man's torso is bloated and misshapen, his skin taking on a grayish hue. The woman's hair appears to have turned into a mass of writhing, snake-like tendrils, framing a face that no longer contains any human warmth. Their arms around each other now look like tangled vines, thick and thorny. The solo traveler holding the fish has changed drastically as well. His legs look fused together, resembling a twisted tree trunk more than human limbs. The fish he was holding seems to have merged with his hand, forming a claw-like appendage. His expression is one of eternal agony. The group of friends around the campfire now look like nightmarish caricatures. One has an elongated neck like a serpent, 
and another has sprouted what seem like wings, but the wings are skeletal and devoid of feathers. Faces are stretched or compressed. Eyes are either too large and bulbous or reduced to mere slits. My grip on the poker tightens involuntarily, my knuckles straining against the skin, turning a ghostly white. I feel the cold metal press into my palm. The photos drop from my hand, landing with a muted thud on the dirt floor. Just as I'm about to return the diaries to their dusty resting place and make for the wooden ladder, an unsettling sound breaks the heavy silence. It's a shuffling noise, soft but distinct. My flashlight's beam trembles as my hand wavers, the light skittering across the uneven floor like a startled animal. I freeze, my ears straining to pick up any hint of what made the sound. Then it comes again, but closer this time, a muted growl that rises from the bowels of the dark room. My muscles tense as if electrified, and my grip on the fireplace poker becomes a white-knuckled clutch. Swiveling around, I direct my flashlight toward the murkier recesses of the basement. And that's when I see them. Indistinct forms lurking in the darkness, their twisted silhouettes eerily resembling the deformed figures in the photographs. I can't make out any facial features in the void, but their eyes are another matter entirely. Those eyes shimmer with an uncanny luminescence, pinning me in their ghastly focus. No, 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 this can't be happening, I find myself muttering, though the words are more an automatic response than a declaration. Whether I'm willing to accept it or not, this nightmare is my current reality, and as my heart thunders in my chest, a voice in my head repeats a single urgent command, get out now. My heart is a relentless drum in my chest as I quickly run toward the wooden ladder. Stay back, I shout. The warning is as much for my own benefit as for whatever lurks in the shadows. In response, one of the figures emits a hiss, a sound so unnerving it propels me into immediate action. I leap onto the first rung and begin to ascend the ladder. My movements are more of a scramble than a climb. Adrenaline surges through me, powering my limbs as I skip steps in my haste. Reaching the top, I thrust the trap door shut with enough force to make the entire cabin shake. My eyes dart around the room, frantically searching for an object to secure the trap door. They lock onto the sofa, a bulky piece of furniture that suddenly seems like my best hope for a makeshift barricade. Summoning a reserve of strength, I shove the sofa across the wooden floor until it sits above the trap door. The weight of the furniture settles into place, forming a barrier that I hope will be sufficient to keep the figures confined to the basement. Panting heavily, I double over, hands on my knees as I try to catch my breath. My gaze remains fixed on the sofa, half expecting the cushions to suddenly bulge upward as those creatures try to force their way through. But nothing of the sort occurs. The room is still. The only sounds are my own labored breathing and the distant crackle of the dying fire. For a moment I consider the improbability of the whole situation. Am I dreaming? Hallucinating, perhaps? But the racing pulse in my temples and the sweat trickling down my back tell me this is no figment of my imagination. I'm in the middle of a nightmare that's all too real. My eyes snap to the journals that are now scattered across the floor. My hands shake as I gather them up and begin flipping through their worn pages. The content is grim but consistent revealing a horrifying curse that taints not just the cabin, but the entire surrounding area. Journal entries document eerie whispers that seem to emanate from the wind itself. The unsettling way the trees appear to close in on the writers, and an ominous change that gradually overtakes anyone who lingers too long. One entry spells it out in stark terms. The longer you stay, the less human you become. It's not just a physical metamorphosis. This curse nibbles away at the core of your being, your very soul. I begin to pace the length of the cabin. My mind zeroes in on my car keys. Where did I last see them? My hands fly through the air, flipping cushions and rummaging through bags scattered around the room. It feels like an eternity, but then my fingers finally find them. Just as I start to entertain the idea of escape, a dull thud reverberates from beneath the floor. From under the sofa, I had moved to barricade the trapdoor. They're trying to get through. Time is not on my side. I need to leave, and fast. The realization dawns that if I don't act quickly, I risk undergoing the same transformation as those unfortunate souls in the basement. My decision is clear. There's no time to ponder the hows or whys of this situation. I dart toward the cabin door, 
throwing it open with an urgency that matches the pounding of my heart. My only focus now is to put as much distance between me and this accursed place as humanly possible. I need to escape before I too become something less than human. I grab a bag and begin to toss in the bare essentials, a change of clothes and some food. While doing this, my eyes are drawn to the small mirror hanging on the cabin wall. My reflection shows something disturbing. My facial features are distorting. A jolt of cold fear runs down my spine. Time is running out. Abandoning the idea of taking anything more, I grab my car keys, my wallet, and a flashlight. I kick open the front door, which swings wildly on its hinges and bangs against the outer wall. The gravel crunches under my feet as I sprint toward my car, parked only a short distance away, but feeling like miles in my heightened state of panic. I fumble with the car keys for a split second before successfully unlocking it. I turn the ignition key. The engine coughs and struggles then falls silent. My heart sinks. I pop open the car hood to confirm my suspicion. The engine wires are a mess. Some are even cleanly cut through. Whoever or whatever did this knew what they were doing. The car is useless now. Taking out my phone, I find there's no signal. I'm completely cut off from the world. I'm alone, and escape is not going to be easy. Panic is rising in my chest, but I wrestle it down. I can't afford to lose control. The forest in front of me is a maze of towering trees, but it offers the only path away from whatever horrors are lurking in the cabin. I grasp my flashlight and plunge into the forest. My feet pound against the uneven ground, dodging roots and rocks as I go. leaving shallow cuts, but the pain barely registers. My mind is singularly focused on getting as far away as possible from the entities haunting me. However, I become painfully aware that I'm not alone in this dark forest. The sounds that reach my ears confirm my worst fears. Footsteps that aren't mine, distant growls, and the cracking of branches. They're in pursuit. Despite the risks, I can't resist the urge to know how close they are. Shining my flashlight over my shoulder, the beam cuts through the darkness and reveals intermittent glimpses of what's chasing me. Misshapen silhouettes, mere shadows that dart between the trees, their unnatural speed making my stomach turn. My lungs feel like they're on fire. Each breath I take is a ragged gasp, as if the very air has thickened. My legs are heavy, as if weighed down by invisible chains. They're screaming at me to stop, to rest, but that's a luxury I can't afford. If I stop, even for a second, it could mean the end of me. The thought propels me forward, stoking the embers of my dwindling energy. Despite the adrenaline flooding my system, I trip over a protruding root, stumbling forward and almost losing my grip on the flashlight. I tighten my grip on the flashlight and push onward. Time loses its meaning as I continue to run, to flee from the unspeakable terror that seems to be always just a step behind. Every snapped twig and every rustle of leaves elevates my heart rate. It's a loop. Run, listen, and run some more, hoping that I'll find a way out of this forest. My eyes lock onto the clearing in the distance. Hope surges through me. This could be my escape. A road or maybe even a cabin belonging to someone else. With this thought propelling me, I summon every reserve of strength I have left. My legs pump faster and I burst into the open space, my feet finally hitting smooth asphalt. It is a road, and never before has a stretch of tarmac felt so incredible. Although I'm out of the forest, I know the danger isn't over. I glance around frantically, desperate for the sight of a car, a streetlight, or a building, any sign that I'm not entirely alone. Just as I'm losing hope, headlights cut through the darkness in the distance. They grow brighter and bigger, moving my way. Is this my rescue, or just another twist in this never-ending nightmare? There's no time to weigh the options. I start waving my arms in the air, hoping to be seen, to signal to the driver that I need help. The car's brakes screech, and it comes to a sudden stop just a few feet from where I'm standing. My heart is pounding in my chest. I can hardly believe it. The driver lowers the car window and peers out at me, his eyes widening in disbelief and concern. What the hell happened to you? You okay? I find it hard to form coherent sentences my words stumbling over each other in my haste. No time to explain. I manage to get out, urgency dripping from every syllable. Can you please just get me out of here? Without another word, the driver nods and unlocks the passenger door. I quickly climb inside, 
As I shut the door and hear the lock click into place, the gravity of my situation begins to really set in. I'm out. I escaped. However, as the car gains distance from the looming tree line, my eyes are involuntarily drawn back to the forest. An uneasy feeling gnaws at me. Those creatures, whatever they are, could be standing just beyond the first row of trees, their eyes tracking every inch the car moves. I shudder at the thought. The driver steps on the gas, and the car hums smoothly as we make our way down the road. While I'm not sure where we're headed, clarity dawns on me about one indisputable fact. I'm never returning to that cabin or the forest that surrounds it. Whatever waits in that darkness can keep it. I'm done.